Hey there, Acid Horizon fans, this is Craig. If you didn't already know, many of us on the podcast have been working with Zero Books to produce video content for their YouTube channel. One of the exciting things coming to the Zero Books channel in the near future is a reading group based on Mark Fisher's post-capitalist desire. Now, their Patreon is distinct from our Patreon account, where we are holding another reading group for a thousand plateaus. Becoming a member of these reading groups is not prohibitive in any sense. In fact, we hope you become a member of both. In either case, we appreciate your support on our Patreon channel, on Zero's Patreon channel, and we hope to see you in one of the groups in the coming weeks. Follow us on Twitter for more information, but for the time being, let's talk about Gilles Deleuze's essay, Imminence, A Life. Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. I want to start today's episode by you taking a moment to imagine something. Imagine your childhood, or maybe it's the childhood of your child or a relative, a family friend, a neighbor, etc. And imagine you as a child or the children that you're imagining at play. And for me, the way that this scene goes down, it's a summer evening. There's a sense in which the humidity might be competing with the coolness. Sweat is stinging the eyes. Dirt is running down the cracks of my elbows and my forehead. And all the children in the neighborhood are playing together. It's games of tag, games of war, soccer games, brief moments of exploration where we dig into a tree stump or investigate this little hedgerow over here and some noise that we might have heard. And we're running around and we're screaming and there's boisterous laughter and pushing each other around, maybe three of us getting on a dirt bike and going down a hill and see who doesn't fall off or who does fall off. And maybe we're making up games on the fly and there's rules being made as the games are being played and the games dissolve into new games. And then suddenly the parents call and the summer evening is over. And at that moment, we all become our names. We become Craig, we become Will, Adam, and Matt, whom we have with us here today to talk about Gilles Deleuze's essay, Imminence, A Life, that's in the collection of essays, Pure Imminence, put out by Zone Books, but it's also in, Matt, is it right, Two Regimes of Madness, it's also featured there. I want us to take this image. There's a few images that Deleuze gives us to explicate this essay. And in our sort of green room chat, we all had some difficulty, some questions uh, about this particular essay. One of the things that Matt said is that a lot of people who encounter this essay see this as one of the most kind of vibey, feel-good essays by Deleuze. Like, it's spiritually moving in some sense. But we're met with some serious philosophical concepts, the concept of imminence, the concept of transcendence, and this notion of a life. And before we get on to all of that, maybe the best way to go about this is to dig in to Deleuze's influence here, one of his mediators, I should say, who is Kant. Because the idea of transcendence, the notion of a transcendental field, has resonances with the work of Kant, and clearly Deleuze is drawing on that. And so maybe I'll go to Adam first. Adam, maybe you can give us a brief summary of that. You don't have to mention Kant right off the bat, but I'm sure you're going to say something about him. So go ahead. <laughs> I have a quote lined up from the Critique of Pure Reason. So I'm going to start with, with Kant, because I think this is very much where Deleuze is working from here. So just look, going into the uh, second big part of the Critique of Pure Reason, the Transcendental Dialectic. So when Kant is talking about principles of, of thought, and particularly principles about how we make judgments about objects, make the judgments of X is Y, I think X is Y, as they're unified under this formal I think, which um, is a location for him of all of our experience. He wants to talk about two different kinds of principles under which we can try and make judgments and try and work things out and try and make inferences uh, using our reason to figure out what sort of objects are around the world and answer questions like, does the world have a beginning in time or has it always uh, already been there? And let me just turn to the Critique of Pure Reason. This is page B352 to B353 in the, B in the second edition and A296 to 297 
in the A edition, the first edition. So he says, We will call the principles whose application stays wholly and completely within the limits of possible experience imminent. But those that would fly beyond these boundaries transcended principles. But by the latter, I do not understand the transcendental use or misuse of categories, which is a mere mistake of the faculty of judgment when it is not properly checked by criticism, and thus does not attend enough to the boundaries of the territory in which alone the pure understanding is allowed its play. Rather, the principles that actually incite us to tear down all those boundary posts and to lay a claim to a wholly new territory that recognizes no demarcations anywhere. Hence, transcendental and transcendent are not the same. The principles of pure understanding we presented above should only be of empirical and not of transcendental use, i.e. of a use that reaches out beyond the boundaries of experience. But the principle that takes away these limits, which indeed bids us to overstep them, is called transcendent. If our critique can succeed in discovering the illusion in these supposed principles, then those principles that are of merely empirical use can be called in opposition to them, imminent principles of pure understanding. So to go back to what the transcendental means here, transcendental conditions for Kant are those that lie at the basis of all possible experience. The transcendental conditions of the possibility of experience can be everything that we experience is sensible and everything that's sensible is under the conditions of space and time, being in space, being in time. Or the transcendental unity of apperception, which is the transcendental fact that every experience is an experience for a subject and every judgment we say about our experiences this feels warm it can put it is uh, located within a formal unity of an i think that can that can follow all of these judgments so imminence here is relating to something that is transcendental but not transcendent Transcendence is a, an imminence of both terms from theology. So to say that God is transcendent is, is to say that he's in that beyond. He transcends all of this stuff. He's up there, separated, sacred in that sense, because he's up there. Imminence is a kind of interiority or an inherence in everything. You can see God in all things because God is imminent, an imminent kind of theology. It comes from the Latin, from you know, the fact, to the fact or condition of being entirely within something. It's Latin immanere, to dwell in, remain. And so looking at someone like Kant, Kant is saying that we're, if we're staying in the conditions of possible experience, then this is imminent to possible experience itself, the very possibility of any experience for Kant. Similar to how for Spinoza, everything is you know, inheres in substance, the substance is conceived uh, of itself in itself. It is in itself. It's not substantial to any other substances in that sort of relation. It's a pure dwelling within itself and that's how it differentiates and proliferates itself and as we go through this paper Deleuze is really going to take a disagreement with Kant as to whether imminence can be defined solely in relation to this idea of possible experience of a consciousness that thinks in categories of a unity of an I of an individual subjectivity that can have a unified sense of I-ness that can formally say that an experience is mine it is mine. It is my experience. Emmanuel Kant's experience he's deducing backwards from. Uh, Deleuze is going to look for a more purer kind of dwelling that is, in a sense, pre-consciousness. The sort of thing that, for Kant, we, can, we can't think about because we're only ever called to an experience and then we can think about the experience after the fact and work backwards to see what conditions must have been there in order for us to have it in the way that, in a way, we're used to having it. That's good. And so what I'll do is I'll just bring us back to basics for a second, and then I'm going to go to Matt, because Matt had the most problems and concerns with this particular essay. So the notion of a transcendental field is what we're talking about here. And Deleuze, in no uncertain terms, says it's a pure stream of a subjective consciousness. It's pre-reflective, it's impersonal, it's sub-representational, sub-personal. You can use all those terms. It might be somewhat of a risk to bring in things like flow states or being in the zone, for example, or moving in accord with the Tao and a feeling of oneness. And we will talk about unity with respect to Deleuze's work because we want to emphasize that, or at least I would like to emphasize that even though Deleuze doesn't ascribe to a notion of unity in the same way that Hegel might, 
there is a concept of unity functional in his work here. But just going back to the idea of flow states and moving with the Tao, being in the zone, those sorts of things, there is a level at which Deleuze is describing a form of consciousness that doesn't realize itself in the form of distinct subject and objects. And the question is, how does that chalk up to any kind of experience that that we could have or reflect upon as, as human beings? To, to me, that would be one of the questions. He gives us some examples, so maybe we can work with that as we go. The, the whole little bit that I did about childhood at the beginning is a riff on something that Deleuze brings in about children midway through the essay. But before we get to all of that, a, a, after Adam and I have said those things, Matt, where are you with this essay? What, what are the problems that you're having. I, I enjoy it. I find it I find there's parts of it which I seem to be able to to grasp and go and you know, sort of hold on to. And particularly when Deleuze himself seems to be struggling to think of a way to exemplify his point. That that's when I see I think I seem to come close to, to, to grappling with this. Because there's a set there's a section towards you know the start of the essay. It's not a very long essay, but it's very dense where he discusses firstly an example, uh, sort of a literary example taken from Dickens, and which I'm, I'm certain we'll talk about, because I think it's a really interesting way of thinking about imminence and life, sort of colon life. And then he seems also dissatisfied with this example. He says that a life should not have to be enclosed in a simple moment when individual life confronts universal death. So then he goes for an, another example to try to also pinpoint what's what he's on about. And again, seems not entirely satisfied that he's done quite what he wanted to do there, which is interesting. Maybe we should just talk about one of the early examples he gives there, then, of Dickens. Because on the one hand, there's imminence, and on the other hand, there's a life. And part of the, the question of this essay is how these things relate. Because part of, part of the thing that was, that's been causing me some confusion is, in my experience with Deleuze in the past, he seems to be using imminence in a way that's quite different than how it is being deployed here. Now, that might be a misunderstanding on my part, but it's a misunderstanding that's given me some confusion. On that question, I think there's an interesting link here, actually, that I, I'm starting to be able to discern. And there's an excellent essay by Vernon Sisney on this essay, which draws out the links with Bergson, Nietzsche, and Spinoza, and the way that imminence relates to this. I think I would say two things. One of them is that there's this curious relation with Sartre, I think, um, the transcendental field, not just the transcendental field, but the ideas of consciousness and individuality and, and, and being a subject and so on. Well, I think what Deleuze is going for here is a kind of a critique of those thinkers before him, like Kant as well in particular, where they, they reintroduce often at the last moment an element of transcendence back into their otherwise you know, largely imminent system. Where for Kant, for example, it's the I, or which sort of unifies the field of possible experience, which isn't going to cut the mustard with Deleuze. Such, such also comes quite close, but not close enough for Deleuze in being able to conceptualize a field of experience which isn't in the end subject to some kind of overriding transcendent unity, whether that's the subject or the object itself. Or that, that seems to be, by the way, I think what he uh, takes from Sartre is Sartre takes consciousness to be something like an in, this thoroughgoing intentionality. It's always towards something being perceived. And it's, so it's therefore still defined in some ways less by the subject, but even more so by the object. And I think what Deleuze is trying to figure out is a way of getting past both of these, not simply to reintroduce the subject or the object back into this. The field of experience of fluxes and flows which can escape from uh, transcendence entirely. Because imminent is only really imminent when it's imminent to itself, as he says. I think that's an interesting idea. It's where the idea of life starts to get introduced in this essay, I think. One of the ways in which Deleuze seems to understand imminence is, in line with Spinoza, I think a Gambon, an essay on this, calls it a kind of generalization of the principle of univocity. And the principle of univocity was the idea that basically we speak of what exists, of things that are, in one and the same voice. Whereas some sort of classic thinkers would say that there's, we can only speak of God an analogy to the material plane in which you and I exist. It's analogous, and therefore it's a transcendence set up in advance. Whereas Spinoza wants to say that, no, it really is, everything is spoken in the same voice, as he calls it, right? And I think it is a gamble, and will correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the points he makes is that imminence is basically a generalization of this. It's it also t and it, it, it's specifically this idea of also of imminent causality in Spinoza. And that, that's what I think Deleuze seems to pick up on in Spinoza as well. For Spinoza, there's this 
zone of indeterminacy between the the action or the, the, the becoming and the agent doing the thing. And what that ties into, I think, is an interesting theme you find in Bergson on time and memory and duration. You find it again in Nietzsche. You find it in Spinoza. And therefore, of course, you also find it in Deleuze. So there's all these sort of peppered references, sort of, some often quite oblique in this essay, to sort of thinkers that Deleuze is traditionally occupied by. I think what I struggle with is I have those thoughts here and there, some things I'm picking out, but what I can't quite do is draw it all, draw it all together just yet. Maybe we will by the end, but I think that the example of Dickens was the closest I came in reading it, to figuring out what how a life relates to imminence. Would you say that you are struggling to definitively give it a name? Yeah. A little, I mean, yeah. joke for yeah. an essay we haven't fully finished covering yet, and that's always a great one. Yeah. I, I guess I have a little bit that I could say, but... Well, maybe you can offer. Yeah, I mean, like my thoughts is I love the fact that what's it, what's a target, what's Deleuze's primary target is the history of 20th century phenomenology. Deleuze is not entirely convinced that this return to Husserlian phenomenology over Sartre is going to be particularly productive. In some ways, Matt is absolutely correct to see the transcendence of the ego kind of functioning in the background, this pre-individual, pre-cogito thing that's not can't be called consciousness. But at the same time, in the last instance, going to say that Sartre fails because he necessarily does not escape the trap of consciousness. What I also like about this essay and what commentators like Agamben have pointed out is that there's a strange game of punctuation going on in this essay. There's always an ellipsis after life, which means there's a game of indeterminability of what Agamben sees as a sort of play on Neoplatonism that Deleuze is making between emanation and what Deleuze will call emanation. And Deleuze is very particular about what sort of capture here looks like. And I think the taking on of predicates and the production of particular realities that are mere actualizations, I think that the use of mere in actuality is really important too, especially if we understand what Deleuze means by the virtual indifference and repetition. I think there's, given that this essay is only, I think, actually just four pages, it's without a doubt probably one of the most complex and historically entangled works. But for me still, my favorite section of this essay is going to be the one that you're going to read a chunk of where it comes from, which is the Dickens story. I think that's where we'll have the most fun. And in fact, I think the most fun with the notion of the political subject right? The unified political subject starts to become a target again for the first time since logic ascends. I think the part that I want to tug on here is the idea that the transcendent is not the transcendental. And there are a few other places in the work of Deleuze and Deleuze and Gattari that we can go to as a sort of reference that might scaffold our understanding of how imminent can be imminent to itself. The notion of The transcendent is something that is produced and made to seem up on high. It could be even the notion of capital itself, something that insinuates itself as being above the system of relations and making it seem as if capital is the productive one and not the workers. That's a kind of transcendent move. Deleuze doesn't want to deny the existence of a dimension of experience and of reality that is not divided between the categories of subject and object, but he doesn't want to say that stands above. It's not above, it's within the system. And so I'll read a little bit here, and then I'm going to give it to Adam because I know Adam will give an excellent interpolation of this section of the text. So Deleuze says, The transcendent is not the transcendental. Were it not for consciousness, the transcendental field would be defined as a pure plane of imminence, because it eludes all transcendence of the subject and of the object. Absolute imminence is in itself. It is not in something, that's important, to something. It does not depend on an object or belong to a subject. In Spinoza, imminence is not imminence to substance. So Matt, as the resident Spinoza should grab onto that. Rather, substance and modes are in imminence, as we are in imminence. 
everything is in imminence. And I, I think in terms of articulating the armature of understanding of this concept, I think what happens on page 26 in, in Zone Books uh, version of this essay is very important. When the subject or the object falling outside the plane of imminence is taken as a universal subject, Kant, Hegel, right? Or as any object to which imminence is attributed, the transcendental is entirely denatured for then simply redoubles the empirical as with Kant and imminence is distorted for it then finds itself enclosed in the transcendent. And I'll stop there. But first, I'll go back to chapter one of Anti-Oedipus, where they talk about the notion of a world of doubles. If you create this transcendent figure, this object that stands outside of the realm of imminence, and then conditions all aspects of that imminent world or reality, it demands then that we double, in some sense, everything that exists in reality for every object in the Kantian way, at least the way that Deleuze reads Kant, there would need to be some sort of transcendent object that stands as a kind of thing in itself, whether the thing in itself is one thing or a plentitude of things or what have you. Or something like Platonic Heaven comes to mind, too. There's a plentitudinous heaven full of all kinds of chairs. However, there is this one specific concept of the chair that, that conditions all all other notions of chair and informs whether or not something is actually a chair here on planet Earth. None of that works in this system. But Adam, maybe you can go on a riff there. So a, a lot of Kantians would rightly be thinking that Deleuze is attacking a subject and object and calling them transcendent or transcendent. And the Kantian response to that is, well, no, they're not transcendent. They don't go beyond, as Kant defined them, the conditions of possibility of experience. And as such, they aren't transcendence, whereas Deleuze is going to say, actually, no, that the fact that the transcendental conditions of the possibility of experience are itself fully detached from any kind of experience, from a pure sort of affectation, they are going to be transcendent. They are going to be fixed points of reference, which do themselves hang over uh, the empirical and redouble it as its divine kind of shadow. I mean, think about Plato in a simulacrum where sort of uh, Deleuze takes the side of the simulacrum, the copy of the forms rather than the sides of the forms themselves. Uh, imminence isn't quite attacking the form, is it attacking the forms because Deleuze doesn't believe in the platonic theory of forms, but the conditioning of transcendence is a creation of theories of forms. If a Kant do have the, the pure form of the transcendental object, the object X, and this corresponding, you've got the transcendental I, and these are the prototypes, the archetypes of experience with which we cannot get beyond. The problem is that there is a huge amount of contingency to how this happens. Kant, in a sense, is saying that he's, a that he's arguing for the necessity of these categories, whereas Deleuze would turn to someone like Hume and say, actually, these are just habitual. The way that Kant, for example, as I've said before on the show, is the way he deduces the unity of the I, the I think, and why, that's, why the I think not only is there, but also has a legitimate claim over the categories of pure reason and about how the categories of thought are the proper categories on which we legislate all objectivity according to thought and judgment and how a science of nature becomes possible because that's how we experience nature. He deduces it using the legal manuals of the Holy Roman Empire in terms of land disputes. Deduction isn't a logical thing in the Aristotelian sense. That comes later in the critique of pure reason in the part on reason. Uh, deduction in the Kantian sense is the deduction of legitimate land rights according to the, the judicial system of the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire used to give out manuals for deduction for this purpose. And what Deleuze and what Nietzsche and what even Spinoza to some extent will say to all of these transcendental thinkers is, this is just your habitual modes of thinking and judgment and categorization over, you know, decades of historical structures and religious structures that inform the historical structures and are themselves historical that have seeped their way into your thinking and into how you desire to think. Because Kant, at the end of the day, gets the kind of experience he wants. And in Nietzsche and philosophy, uh, Deleuze and somewhat Nietzsche are very sort of biting about this. So to think about a pure imminence, it's probably not the question of thinking about a non-desiring subject, but what it's almost like doing a transcendental of the transcendental. What is the condition of, well, probably not even possibility, but virtuality in which these possible kinds of experience could arise, this habitual mode of feel. So when we are, when our sense organs are affected by something, suddenly we almost pull through 
this transcendental field, this net of categories and presuppositions, or a particular region of it that corresponds to a certain kind of habit. And then we suddenly go, oh, I think this about that. We are yanked through, through individuation at an infinite kind of speed. Because in the same way that, I mean, consciousness, a, conscious, a conscious experience is instantaneous. The fact that we're called into this processing of it, and eventually we go through an experience, and as, as Deleuze says, and also Hegel says, consciousness is also the production of the subject at the same time as it's uh, be- becoming conscious of the object. Because consciousness isn't uh, simply a moment, but it's only a moment at the, at the last instant, so to speak. We're thinking through, we're getting all of these processes of sense data, and then they're all unified and collected through these categorizations into an experience. But from the empirical position itself, it all happens all at once. It happens at infinite speed. So I think this is the way to think about infinite speed as the way in which we are yanked from a pre-individual singular. We are a singular place in which experience happens for someone like Hume. And we just get accustomed to thinking about it, this bundle of properties and affects and sensations as an I. And for Kant, he's trying to make that a necessary thing, a necessary kind of categorization. Whereas Deleuze, what he's trying to think about with transcendental field is the kind of force that lies at the bottom of that, in which we're just a singular, I'm just a walking territory of sensation. And then something affects a part of me that senses or something, this territory that senses is affected by something, something moves into it. And suddenly consciousness is yanked through this transcendental field the singular is yanked through all of these kinds of categories and habits of individuality that's cultivated over thousands of years of history and the history of experience itself and education, and then says, oh, well, I think that was all right, yeah. What are the conditions of possibility for the conditions of possibility? And what if, the, and what if those conditions of possibility for the conditions of possibility are not themselves homogenous with possibility itself? What if it's something deeper, more virtual? Okay. So this is where I almost feel like I'm starting to get what Deleuze is saying. But I want to put it the way I read him, and then hopefully Adam can help me clarify this. Because I think actually what Deleuze is saying is, is slightly different. I think what he wants is, I don't think he's interested at all in consciousness or experience or subjectivity. I don't think he, I think he actually quite deliberately wants some understanding of imminence, in which we basically don't even use the words consciousness, subjectivity, experience, etc. And I think what he seems to be saying is that the problem with Kant, with with Sartre, with Merleau-Ponty, and so on, is that they always, in some way, bring this back in. Sartre comes really close because he evacuates the unity of, of you know, in some sense, this, this transcendent ego, but. Nevertheless, there's a unity in the experience of the object and that in its sort of intentionality. There's still a kind of center to it. And so he still doesn't go the whole way. Deleuze wants to get rid of, I think, at least just my reading, and I, I admit openly I was quite struggling with this one, but I think he wants to get rid of all of this. Because at every moment that you reintroduce something called experience or something called the subject or something called the ego, or whatever, cogito, every time you do that, you reintroduce transcendence straight back in. Because then imminence is imminent to something, which is exactly what he says is not imminence. And so that's when I get a little bit stumped. Not stumped, stumped's the wrong word. Because I can see in some sense in the abstract what is going on there. I can mentally remove those concepts from the terrain going on in my head right now. And I can see, okay, now he wants to understand what's left here, say. What is that? What is left of, let's say, experience without a thing experience, a thing, or whatever. And then I, th- it, I, am I right in thinking that this is where the idea of a life plays this role of pure imminence? Because, and I, I know we were going, we were just about to talk about this sort of example of the Dickens story. It's a life is a kind of, it, it has nothing to do with your subjecthood, your individuality, you know, your individuation or anything. It's, um, in fact, in a certain sense, the greater the subjectivity, and this is sort of the way this example is used, the more you are, in a certain sense, this thing called a life seems to retreat in, in this example. And so it's absolute pure imminence, and yet it's utterly opposed, it seems, to any conception of, of some sort of center of experience, of I or sets of possibilities. 
I, I find that quite hard to conceptualize, but that's, am I right in thinking that that seems to be where he's going with this essay? So, so here's my take on it, and, and I'm going to refer directly to the text. First of all, I think the notion of a life is not reducible to a notion of consciousness. However, he says unequivocally in the first few sentences of the essay that it appears as a pure stream of a subjective consciousness. Because what he doesn't want to do, and I, I think the risk here is by evacuating a notion of consciousness or putting it somewhere else in the system, not letting it permeate the, the whole system, well, he's going to essentially undermine the task of defining what imminence is. But I, I think a better way to go about this might be to riff on Proust and Sainz a little bit and talk about this notion of being between. I definitely don't think Deleuze is disposing whole cloth, a notion of individuality. Because throughout a life, ellipsis, let's say it's the life of Matt, for example. In your life, your experience of yourself as a subject, juxtaposed with objects, other people, things in your world, is something that has been constantly in flux. Your own self-understanding has been contingent upon this series of moments that define your life. And one of the challenges is, what is it that allows the whole of that flux, the whole of that process, to come together in some semblance of unity? And what Deleuze talks about here is, there are these other moments in life that don't establish themselves or stick out as fully rendered moments of identifiable subjectivity. It doesn't have that kind of solidity. There's an in-between. There are these ambivalences, passing stages, if you will. There's a passage of a life into these moments of subjectivity, which are rendered differently at different moments in time. And the whole thing that happens in Proust and Signs, at least the way that I understand it, is... So, for example, we can be so many different people. I mean, just think about living under capitalism, all the part-time jobs that people have, the kinds of relationships we have, friendships, meeting people on the internet and starting podcasts. It's absurd. It's just this very weird thing when you think about it. And to get a sense of what is it that encompasses this whole, the whole search for meaning in life, especially for people in the latter portion of their lives, is often one that's frenetic in the sense of, I've had all of these disparate moments, life as an alcoholic, life as a parent, life as someone who's unemployed, life as someone who's been very successful. All of the things that I just mentioned could comprise a life. But then there's these interstices that stand in between. And there's also this moment in some lives, in many lives, where our understanding of our life as being whole as being consummated, it's like an aha moment. Ah, I, I get what all that was about now. The fact that I went to the prom with Jenny in 1994, but you know, something like that. And then if I didn't meet that person, this would have never happened. And now it's so wonderful that I have this family. And then the next thing you know, your family falls apart. And now you've become something completely other than that consummation of yourself as a subject. We build up we become subjects, and then we break apart and we become these other things. And there are these other aha moments along the way that tend to consummate the entirety, the, the whole history of who we have been. And so I think what Deleuze wants to say about a life is that the notion of imminence is that all is in imminence. The distinctly fully rendered moments of subjectivity, also those vague interstices, those parts where we're, we're very uncertain of who we are. And I think the ethics that's suggested here is that we develop a kind of equanimity with respect to the notion that these series of meanings and the very immediate and intense experience of life are conjoined in a way that's counterintuitive. It's not that there's a grand shell that encapsulates all of the moments of our lives. In fact, for Deleuze, the experience of unity is just another one of the moments in the series of moments of the experience of our own subjectivity. One that occurs within the same transcendental field, the same imminent field in which all of the more definite and in which all of the ambivalent experiences 
of our lives occurs. I'm just thinking that, so we, we, we've been stepping around this passage where the example of a life, maybe it would be helpful if we just, if we, someone, perhaps Craig with his sort of velvety tones could read the passage about. Sure, sure. Um, and, and in fact, I, I brought in some extra credit for this assignment too. So I'll read that <laughs> passage on a life, but there's also an article and I'll link it in the show notes. It's from the LA Review of Books. It was published on November 8th, 2015. It's called A Singular and Yet Non-Arbitrary Life. And this is a retrospective, uh, like a memoriam, the 20th anniversary of the coming to pass of Deleuze. But first, I'll read the relevant section. So we're going to talk about this story from Charles Dickens that Deleuze references here. And the name of the story is a lesser known story. It's the same respected friend in more aspects than one. And I'll read what Deleuze has written, then I'll actually read the bit from the story that he references. What is imminence? A life. Ellipsis. No one has described what a life is better than Charles Dickens. If we take the indefinite article as an index of the transcendental, a disreputable man, a rogue, held in contempt by everyone, is found as he lies dying. Suddenly, those taking care of him manifest an eagerness, respect, even love for his slightest sign of life. Everybody bustles about to save him to the point where, in his deepest coma, this wicked man himself senses something soft and sweet penetrating him. But to the degree that he comes back to life, his saviors turn colder, and he becomes once again mean and crude. Between his life and his death, there is a moment that is only that of a life playing with death. The life of the individual gives way to an impersonal and yet singular life that releases a pure event freed from the accidents of internal and external life. That is, from the subjectivity and objectivity of what happens. And so I'll just pause right there. And I, I mean, I, th I think the example that Deleuze points out maps on to precisely what I was talking about is there, there are these ruptures, and especially now, maybe, maybe being the, the oldest one on this, this podcast, as you become an adult and you have so many relationships and the nature of your relationships change over time and knowing that the sort of distance and coldness with which very familiar people might treat one another, and then something like a rupture happens and for a moment things can change. But of course, in, in Deleuze's mention of this story, that coldness comes rushing right back in when the person comes back to life. And the person who wrote this article here, their name is Greg Lambert. They put it very nicely. And I'll just go ahead and I'll, I'll read what they have written. It's very nice. So this story, the same respected friend in more aspects than one from, I think it's a collection, Our Mutual Friend, is about a character named Ryder Hood who in the beginning of the story drowns in the Thames in a boat accident whose body is carried back to his apartment to await the doctor and the police. In reading Dickens' own account, however, or rather the narrator's, one can immediately locate the passage that inspired all of Deleuze's attention on this story. The scene occurs in the second paragraph of the story, which describes the doctor and the attendants examining the dank corpse, at which point the doctor declares the body of the man, not hopefully, at least not worthy of the effort of reanimating. At this moment, to which I'll return below, we find the following passage. No one has the least regard for the man. With them all, he has been an object of avoidance, suspicion, and aversion. We know people like this, right? But the spark of life within him is curiously separable from himself now. So just my interpolation here, we have this semblance of life, we have life there, but now the subjectivity that was capped on top of it has at least been temporarily dissolved. And they have a deep interest in it, so the people around him are like very interested. Look, this crude, cold man lying here, he might be alive. L let's see what we can do. Probably because it is life. And they are living and must die. In other words, it is the recognition of a spark of life that rises up from the dank corpse of an individual for whom no one had the least regard while he was living, and whom everyone often sought to avoid in life, that suddenly became the object of deep personal interest by everyone in attendance. And even as Deleuze describes it, 
occasioning in each person the feeling of beatitude. So right here at the end, we have the introduction of this notion of an affective shift. Because look, here are the stakes for me as a reader ethically. There needs to be an upshot here. If we're not referring to some sort of transcendent entity, if we're talking about the very world within which we live, I want to see some sort of ethical upshot. And this is one of the things that Deleuze points to. And what he's going to say is, at least in one occasion of this rupture, there's going to be this affective shift. That's like a beatitude, a becoming of ourselves where we're released from the ironclad nature of our subjectivity that we can pour through the cracks of the armor, as it were. But that's the story, and that's the just a, a piece of the essay that I found online. Matt, what does that do for you now that you've heard all of that? Yeah, I, I think that it, it's almost reassuring hearing you put that across, really, because as I was reading, I, I, I thought, I think Deleuze is saying this, but I'm not certain. So hearing that sort of way of expressing it helps with that, because there's this interesting bit, I'm not sure... Um, if this exact sentence um, was read a moment ago, there is a passage that uh, Deleuze writes that it's no longer, in a, a sort of a, it's perhaps corpus for a man who's close to death at least, there's no longer an individuation but a singularization, a life of pure imminence, neutral, beyond good and evil, since only the subject that incarnated it in the midst of things made it good or bad. The life of such individuality is eclipsed by the singular imminent life of a man who no longer has a name though we can be mistaken for no other, a singular essence, a life. And it, and I, I could be completely wide of the mark here, but maybe what Deleuze is trying to get at or to uncover is a sense of that life which lies beneath in a certain sense or behind any concrete subjectivation that we all go through. That seems to be what Deleuze is finding interesting here about this sort of literary example is that there's this thing called a life, which, as he puts it, is incarnated in the midst of things by this particular man, in this, in this case, but which in this strange moment is allowed to return, right, and sort of re-emerge in a sense. And he says also that, that he's not quite satisfied that this example is, has done what he needs it to do. So then he talks about infants, and he says that it seems a singular life can do without any individuality at all, even without any of the concomitants that individualize it. For example, infants all resemble one another and have hardly any individuality, but they do have singularities, a smile, a gesture, a grace. Such events are not subjective traits. And I think that's interesting. I, I, I actually wonder if Will has any thoughts on this, because I'm sure he read it. I read it as well, or I, I had less time with it. Gambon has an essay exactly on this of this text by Deleuze and this question of a life which lies beneath or in some sense but behind processes of subjectivation and, and, and individuation that seems like the sort of thing that, that Agamben would have thoughts on in terms of like bare life and Aristotle and, and so on so <laughs> I like it I think this is the closest I get to seeing what, what's going on here so in, in some ways what I get from that reading of the Dickens story is a life that once again begins to take on its predicates, right? And all of the people surrounding him start to be captured once again by the very political affects that they felt towards this individual because this individual comes back and this statue starts to manifest again. And as it begins to manifest, so too do, do all the various affinities that produced his abandonment come back as well. So this idea of a life, in a certain sense, we can't understand it outside of a few things. We can't understand it outside of an ontology of univocity. We have to understand it in relation to the necessity to exclude the transcendence of being. And then also, this is Deleuze just at his most basically Spinozist. But I know you have, you push back at the, on that a little bit. You think that there's a place where he breaks with Spinoza either later or here, I don't know. But when it comes to a Gombin, for me, what I would see in that moment of the Dickens story is the function and purpose of life as that which is produced through like interactions with social apparatuses. We, we cannot think of that moment in the Dickens story as anything more or anything less than the absolute importance of life's relationship 
to its predicates. So that would probably be where I'd bring in Agamben. Whether or not like Agamben has a relationship to this sort of pre-particular, not quite Bergsonian vitalism, I, I don't know if if I'd be comfortable with saying that there is like a vitality there. Because I don't think that's what Agamben is necessarily after when he talks about life. I think he's probably closer to that other figure that he mentions in this essay up top which would probably be Foucault. But yeah, I think that it I think that it's an interesting it's an interesting connection to draw. What I wish we had was a better understanding of Husserl and of the phenomenologists because I do actually think what Deleuze is providing to us is like a real serious critique and a reminder of like the dangers of like psychologists in understanding experience. I think it's also also worth just actually first thing talking about the university of being just as a quick a simple one sentence way of explaining university that I think is goes a long way is that the idea of university literally one voice. Being speaks with one voice. When we speak of being, we speak in the same voice as um, the same motion, the same flow of existence as that which being itself is as it flows through all things as they endure and exist and, and live and die, even if they don't necessarily live or die. So you know, be, being speaks with one voice but at different volumes. And we can think about life here as a kind of, in a way, rising in volume until it hits a kind of a, a transcendental frequency, it enters this this zone of resonance or zone of refrain upon it, which it, you know comes back onto this idea of the subject. And what I think is also very important to think about with this Dickens example is that ultimately this example is to, to some extent from a perspective not only as a narrator, but not from the perspective of people caring for this person, but to, an ex- to some extent, trying to articulate the perspective of that person themselves, their own sort of feelings as this sort of life, this living sort of collective affects within this territory that is their body sort of rises back up into the sphere of a life that can you know, call itself an I. So I, I, otherwise, I think you get into some pretty murky territory if you're trying to catch this out ethically. So at the end of the day, there's always a spark of life and that's worth fighting for. No, I'll give you an example. Boris Johnson got COVID, apparently in intensive care. He wasn't, he was watching Lord of the Rings on an iPad. He admitted this. Suddenly a bunch of people I know were like, we've had our disagreements, but you know, they was doing this nonsense from the other side of the story. So he's a life at the end of the day. So no, fuck him. The amount of people that man is like condemned to death through austerity measures that he's voted for. No, absolutely. Return to the void from whence you came and don't fucking come back. So I, I think in terms of the ethical conceptions here, we're getting some dirty territory. You could read this like a, a complete and total charlatan like Justin Murphy and say that this is a view of the sanctity of life. This is a crypto-Catholic posturing. It's not absolutely. Uh, this is about the undergirding force that propels a consciousness into being through the field of possible experience by which you know, I think a life is more living pre-individual wise. There's a territory in which life is very heavily concentrated. You know, a certain kind of a certain kind of life that can experience a certain kind of sense of life. A life has a sense within itself and of itself that can arise into this zone of experientiality, which we see in every being that experiences. Now I don't think Deleuze is going to say we can determine for different degrees because then you'd commit him to some kind of um, essentially a kind of skull measuring phrenology of, of ontological phrenology. And as we all know, we're, you know, we're not dealing with Heidegger here. So overall, I think that the question of an ethicality, so this has to be really paced out very carefully. There's a temptation, I did think, when we were talking about this, to think about Mladen Dolar's essay, The Smoking Communism. The idea that in, in the smoking area, everyone's just someone having a smoke. Everyone comes together in the smoking area. If someone asks you for a spare, for a spare cigarette, unless it's your last one, there is a prison non sort of, they're not, they have, they have done with the judgment of God. They're just someone who needs a smoke. I'm trying very hard not to use the English word for smoke. I agree. I think we do run the risk of a kind of affective fallacy in interpreting this concept of a life. That said, I, I think it's noteworthy that Deleuze uses the beatific example because I, I think in terms of political prospects, 
I think we want something like what happens in the Dickens story, but perhaps without the ensuing irony. On our episode with Andrew Culp, Andrew said something that I think runs pretty close to Deleuze's example. And I've said this before on, on a previous episode, the idea of a protest that turns into a riot, where the protest banner in the moment at which things kick off and, and the action's happening and the cops start shooting tear gas and that sort of thing. The banner, which was once this sort of representational apparatus, actually becomes a kind of weapon or a shield uh, in the moment. And in, in the collapse of the immediate subjectivity of the protest, there is this sort of between moment in which it becomes the riot. And everything gets reconfigured. And in that moment, you find out who's your friend and ally. And it doesn't matter if the person standing next to you comes from a political tendency that you fight with on Twitter. In that moment, that person could be an ally. It's an immediate reconfiguration of forces. So at once, it, it could be beatific or something like that in the sense that, oh, here we are fighting the good fight against the forces of domination. But also, we can look at this notion of a life happening in, in so many different ways as a kind of rupture. Even in some sort of a banal way, moving from the city to the countryside, for example, there's a way in which every day I have to shift and be aware of new things. Snakes hanging out in my shed, hornets flying into my kitchen, and the kinds of tools that I work with and the kinds of ways that I operate in the environment, the way that I become aware of that environment happens in these sort of lapses of this old identity into the new. And there's this kind of like fuzzy area sometimes of this isn't me or I don't feel like I used to feel. And I think it's in those between moments that you, you have these shifts of subjectivity and we get a scent of it or we get an intimation of what a life looks or feels like. It's these shifts that like in some ways the Heideggerian conception of being in the world can't account for. Right. Maybe like a lot of Heideggerians are going to come after me for this because there's always some element of like his 1925 lectures that actually mentions this or whatever. But like in a certain sense, like what's so fascinating is it's precisely that shift, right? That gap that Deleuze has always been particularly obsessed with, whether it's the logic of sense where the revolutionary position is to be in the gap between the law and and the signified. Or the shift from having, from understanding the technicality, the, this particular way, this to particular technicality as it relates to your home, which now has to have a completely different context in relation to a wasp that has just entered and so on. I, I think that there's like an interesting continuity into Liz's work, particularly about this question of this shifting stance of any given process of subjectivation, given its world. I'm going to say this, Craig. I might be completely wrong. If I am, just cut it out. Okay, just cut it out. <laughs> but I'm thinking back to when I first started reading Deleuze. One of the ways I got started was I was I went through the lecture series by Todd May, which is on YouTube, about difference and repetition. And one of the concepts he's trying to explain is the idea of the virtual, if I'm correctly. Um, and one one of his sort of students, who think, I think he's read ahead a little bit, asks if this is actually the transcendental field. And May says, yes, it really is. And what he's talking about, the example that May discusses is the idea of a hypothetical infant. And we can say, okay, one day, perhaps this particular child will grow up to become this person or that person, but isn't this is sort of a, 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 a sort of philosophical problem, right? Because presumably, who they're going to become in the future is not simply determined by genetics. There's no sort of gene in there or whatever that's going to determine who they become. But it's also not completely openly and indeterminate either. So the answer has to be sort of perhaps metaphorically somewhere in between that. And May argues that that's what the transcendental field is. It's populated by these virtual possibilities, which are themselves actualized in concrete circumstances over and over again, always. Right? And so it's not completely open, but it's also not completely determined in advance who that, who that person will become in the future. And I wonder if that's maybe what Deleuze is sort of getting at here as well in this question of, he, he explicitly talks about the, the, the example of an infant, and he also goes to the other end, the finality of death, but the life that emerges in that moment too. But cut back, I think he just calls it singularization, but not an individualization, right? About that sort of moment of closeness to death. And I don't know. You'll probably want to cut that out. I don't think I made much no, sense. No, no. That's exactly that, right? it. That's exactly it. 
and I, I think he says as much in this text. I could go hunting for it, but I, I think that's exactly it. Just to push back a little bit on the notion that we can't derive an ethics from this, I think we can in the Nietzschean sense of we can be all the names of history. What does that mean in this case? Well, it means that through the various configurations of individual identity, their coming to pass, this experience of singularities that then pushes up and condenses as new forms of subjectivity. Th this is a process by which our lives proceeds. And I, I, I mentioned earlier, I, I think it's not an ethical imperative, but the way that we ride the wave, as it were, is by cultivating a kind of equanimity, a way that allows us to not only engender, but, but accept to affirm all of that which we were, the worst parts of ourselves, the most cringe aspects of ourselves, our glorious moments, and those ambivalent moments that comprise a life. Because at, at the end of the day, what is life for somebody like Deleuze, but this constant kind of adaptation, this, this series of configuring and reconfiguring into new forms of subjectivity and adapting to our environment. And then we die as individuals. But the potential for a kind of sublimity is within the idea that we can live with an understanding of our life as something more than being an individual. I know, Matt, you and I, we've gone back and forth on the concept of individuality several times, and I think Deleuze provides some answers here in the sense that, of course, there, there is individuality. There are these moments. They're not all the same, but there is something that subsists or is imminent with that, which is a life, and yeah. it has a I'm, membrane that's distinct, I think, in some sense from individuality. But anyway, Matt, you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, Sisney's essay on, on this, and also shout out to him, great life. He calls attention to the fact that there's a really key passage here where Deleuze refers again to duration, which he hasn't done elsewhere and, and hasn't done for quite a while, the publishing of this essay. So that's another reason. I think you're right, Craig, there's a connection here. This, this, I think that bringing back in this conception of duration, which is key to him and to Bergson, is probably, he's, I think that's part of what's going on there and doing, sort of making the link. So just to make a kind of a series of small summary remarks, so say it if we, and this is probably not helpful, but say we have a philosophical zoom function and we zoom out and we look upon the whole of being. So at the highest level, the macro level, the macrocosm, let's say, we have the transcendental field, right? So if this is, as Todd May is saying, is the virtual, could we say that in this biggest region, this open hole, this biggest region of being is the, the, the space of possible possibilities, right? And then as we restrict them into a realm of consciousness, we get a realm of possibilities that are actual possibilities, but only actual for consciousness insofar as things are experiencing consciousness, insofar as all of these senses, these possible senses, only become actually possible senses for a consciousness. And then if we zoom, and then insofar as we take the idea of a life, which is a sort of possible possibility for being to be in this kind of way we can zoom in this condensation in, in this territory almost like it goes up into the head so to speak and then you have the actual possibilities of experience is unified by individuality is that what we're going for this, the a life is a life which is indefinite it's essentially traversing this field of possible possibilities or virtualities and then this territory, this float, this this territory of sense that has all these organs and bodies. This body moving through this field of virtuality, it is possible possibilities. And when consciousness happens in the way, there's an act of condensation or condensing, or compounding, or compositing. When the possible possibilities become confined within an individual with certain kinds of limits of its own possible experience. And then we get actual possibility of experience, which shape how it makes sense, literally making sense of the world insofar as it's the sort of thing that it is. And it's enclosing itself within the sort of thing that it is. And you could say the the word that does, in a way, many ways hates, but because he really mentions Victor and, and, that, and, and there's a big German idealist tradition of this, is that it can finally say I. Infants don't really say 
much or they don't or at least okay they don't say the word i whereas for fichter and schelling and specifically fichter and schelling really and kant as soon as an infant says i it's fucking hell individuated it can now make sense of the world according to the conditions of unity because it's not that it didn't have it before but this is like the first time it's explicit about it it's no lot it's, it's now the kids can say i and then i think this about this then it has the faculties of autonomy because it can divide itself between the formal unity of the I that makes it, uh, that puts everything into its, what can we call its transcendental location as being my experience, as it says it. And the empirical I, the the, the I of uh, what Kant would call psychology. So is this the kind of life and experience that that we're dealing with here? Have we sussed it, lads? I think so. We'll give Will a shot. Will, maybe you'll have the last word? I think... There's, at the base of this essay, a kind of attempt to avoid precisely the horrifying concern that always comes with uh, asubjective consciousness, and instead allow for an understanding of imminence that can show a kind of radical ontological freedom. So for that reason, I think this is just this is Deleuze at his highest form. End of career, mm. peak scholarly, peak scholarly reflexivity. Like he knows exactly what he needs to pull from and where he needs to pull from to do what he's doing. I feel like I was unequipped for this essay. It's two pages, but it's still extremely dense. And I'll just close. Deleuze at his shortest is always Deleuze at his densest. Whether it's <laughs> Society of Control or this, or even the Hume essay in the same book that, that Craig and I are pulling from, that this is Deleuze at his densest. <laughs> Mm-hmm.